Yo, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the This Week in Overwatch League podcast with your boy ATP. And today is all about doing a bit of a recap and discussion on the final week of the East Knockouts, as well as the exciting start to the West play-ins. A ton of crazy stuff happened, especially on Sunday. So I just want to get right into this. There's so much on my mind, so much fun stuff that happened that we that's just a must talk, really. So where I wanted to begin this episode is with what you see on screen. Toronto Defiant versus the Vancouver Titans. The third battle of Canada this season goes the way of Toronto once again, this time in exciting reverse sweep fashion in one of the more exciting games that we've seen this year in general, I'd say, outside of the top tier teams. Vancouver really made Toronto earn this one. I was not expecting to find to have their backs against the wall. I think most people weren't in that position, even if you were a Titans believer. To see them go up 2-0 in this series early on and have a clear advantage was interesting, to say the least. It seemed like the Titans were having a hard time grasping the meta, even just as early as the weekend before this tournament. But they came out strong. They came out hot. They had a very obvious plan, and it worked to perfection. And I think they deserve a lot of praise, even though they did end up going on to eventually choke away this series. On Oasis, it started. You could see it right away. It was all about going after Hydron and going after Sir Majed. Those were the two targets that Vancouver had in their minds. And that is kind of who we saw get absolutely rolled for the first half of the series, at least, over and over. They rely heavily, well, Toronto, that is, on Hydron doing his thing with the flanks on Soldier. And then you have Majed popping off on the Alari. He's been a really good extra source of playmaking for them recently. But they didn't let them have a lot of space. They were ready for Hydron's flanks, and they targeted Sir Majed like crazy. He had no real chance to have an impact on the game, I feel like. And that's ultimately what led to a very early lead in this series. They invested in Sugar Freeze Genji. They let Hisang go on the flank as well to counter Hydron. And they didn't give in to the Defiance strategies, whether it be with Orisa or Sigma. Titans came in with a plan. We're not going to play the Queen anymore. We're going with the Orisa. Punk apparently has an Orisa now. He's been working on it. He looked pretty good for a while in this series, and it worked beautifully in the first half. Uh, I think that aside from the DPS doing their thing and Crimson being flexible, or not Crimson, excuse me, Punk being flexible, Crimson and Faith had a pretty huge impact in the early section of this series. I thought they put in a lot of work. They're generally outplaying their support counterparts. Crimzo, for about, I don't know, three and a half maps, let's say, was hitting everything. Honestly, throughout the entire series, he had some really excellent moments, hitting huge sleep darts, landing big nades, 1v1ing Hydron, amongst other people. He had himself a day, and I think fo uh, Faith followed in suit on the Lucio especially on Dorado. His Lucio stats went pretty crazy during that specific map. They were just doing everything to give the Titans a real clear advantage over their Toronto counterparts. And it seemed like they might actually wrap this up in a sweep. They had all the momentum. The, the momentum. They even stopped uh, Defiant on Nimbani with their Sigma strat and extra rounds. They had a better attack. Things were looking super, super good. But then as the series went on, the Titans couldn't really seem to finish the job, which has been a common theme when it comes to significant games this year. That always seems to be the case with them, which is why I also had a hard time trusting them aside from their recent struggles. They kind of just took their foot off the gas. Um, New Queen Street just didn't go their way. Uh, Defiant had a lot more success with the Sigma this time for sure. Uh, Hydron was starting to have his way more. Spectre on the Torb was a real problem. Majed had a bit more space. He was doing a good job of countering Sugar Free whenever he'd played with his ult of his own. And they went down really early, like significantly. And had they maybe made changes earlier in that map, maybe there's a world where they actually don't need to pull off such a big comeback to get back into it. Maybe they could have won the series right there and then if they had made the swaps earlier. But nonetheless, this was their choice. They went down like 100 meters to 30 or whatever it was, and it was just too much to come back from. They came super close, but Defiant just had to bank on ults and having the right economy for the last fight to pretty much end things there. 
And that's when Defiant woke up, I feel like. It was from that moment onward where this felt like Defiant series to win again. It's like they remembered they're supposed to win. They are the superior team and that they've been the better team in recent memory. Because, or excuse me, I said New Queen Street was the third map, didn't I? I meant the fourth map. They should have ended on the fourth map is what I meant to say. But um, it felt like from the end of the third map onward on Suravasa until Dorado, it was just all defiant in the kill feed and just with the level of confidence that we saw. It just felt like a night and day difference between the first half of the series, really. Titans let it all slip away. They were down in the dumps. It's seemingly after the fourth map, I feel like. You could really tell by the looks on both teams' faces that this game was taking a big time turn for the worst. But you gotta give it up to Titans. They did put a really good effort into Dorado on attack to stop the bleeding, to keep that momentum from shifting any further. They even completed the map. Like, that's really impressive. Dorado's a very tough map to finish, always has been throughout its history. But the problem was they didn't have much of a good defense. <laughs> Defiant just finished with more time, so there was really no chance for them. But I, I do find it impressive that they showed some resilience towards the end of the series, and that they were able to keep up with Defiant in general. They were the underdogs for sure coming into this one, but they showed they can fight on even ground and that they're learning quickly and that they're flexible and there might still be a chance for them after all. It's a really good sign to see them keep up with Defiant who are commonly seen as the second best team in this tournament, if not the best. So that's a great sign and maybe gives you some hope that a loser's bracket run could be in their future. I'm not gonna say anything's guaranteed. This kind of loss is very heartbreaking. It can absolutely boom you and derail your season. But Titans have shown some good resilience this year. And outside of Defiant, I think they could most definitely be all of the other teams in the loser's bracket. Although I don't know how it would go if they played Boston, let's say. But you get the idea. I think there's certainly still a chance for them. I think I underrated them coming into this. They're a very resilient and smart squad. They're small, but they know what they're doing. They're intelligent. Not a lot of superstars, but they play well together. Good all-around effort by the Titans, but Defiant prevailed because they are the better team. They were supposed to win this series. It's a little worrying that it took them as long as it did. It's worrying to see them go down 2-0. It is a good sign that they fought back, though, and they didn't give in. That, I think, kind of makes up for it a little bit. That's the kind of resilience you need to show if you want to go far and make the playoffs and potentially even go on a playoff run. But still, I don't like that they struggled that much. Uh, that kind of gives some more room for them to potentially choke, especially if they don't beat Boston. Things might get scary for them. So just keep that in mind, Defiant fans. However... Along with Defiant winning this game, there were some pretty funny moments that I think made it just all around really entertaining that I wanted to go over with you guys. First and foremost, if you're in my co-stream, you know, I was laughing my butt off for Suravasa. Oh my god. I was dying. And it's all because Hydron and Hisang, they went on probably the most wild flank battle I've ever seen in like the history of professional Overwatch. This is something you see in like a quick play game, let alone ranked or professional level. What Hisang was doing was absolutely hilarious. This was his plan basically the entire series. This is what the Titans wanted him to do. Lock the legs, follow Hydron around. This guy likes to go on the weird flanks and the weird angles. You're gonna follow him. You're gonna make his life a nightmare. And that's what he did for this entire map and pretty much the entire first half of the series. Like we see it right here, right? You see he's saying all the way down here where Hydron is. Usually it's just Hydron there compared to the normal team, but he's saying he's gonna follow him around. He's looking out for these angles. And right away, they actually punish Hydron on this fight, if I can find it. Yeah, Crimso hits a big sleep on him. They're just absolutely ready. They've seen the film. They know what Defiant like to do on these types of maps. So boom, they make him pay for it. And that's what they did a lot of this map, despite it not being enough. Maybe they hard focused Hydron too much, but it wasn't a bad strategy. That's for sure. It's just funny though, because it, it continuously happened throughout most of this map where they were just trying to piss off Hydron at all cost. <laughs> there was another moment too, later on where Hydron gets owned again. I don't know if, I don't think he gets slept. No, this is it though, yeah. 
Freaking Crimson in chat says sit after he slept Hydron in the previous fight. And Hydron's response is you're Canadian. Like, great comeback, bro. Regardless, though, I thought that was so funny. And in a way, it's kind of the thing that woke up the beast, so to speak, and maybe led to their undoing. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes into the series than that. But they really pissed off Hydron with this, with the strap. They made the angry version of him come out. And for the rest of the series, he just played a lot better. This map was up and down for sure, but as it went on, he continued to kind of have more of a presence, I feel like. But this map continues to get funnier and funnier as it delves into more and more madness. I have some times I'm going to look up on the screen. Again, here we go again, right? So you're going to see he's saying end up not being with his team, going on these weird angles, just looking for Hydron. Him and Faith are together right now. He... He, he just did this throughout this entire map. It was so funny. Him and Hydra were having a competition almost to see who could be the sillier player. <laughs> like, look look where he is right now. What what are you doing there, bro? I, I didn't think he got any goofier than Hydron, but I was wrong. He saying took it to a whole new level of goofy in this series. And again, fast forward a couple more minutes to like 317, I believe. Like 31720-ish. Again, look where he is, for those of you watching right now. Look. Look what he's doing. He's literally waiting for Hydron. Like, what kind of set plan is this? It's so goofy. It's so, so crazy. This man is in Narnia looking for Hydron. It, that's like his only objective in this series. <laughs> it's so good, dude. I think there's a couple more. I'll, I'll fast forward to like one or two more just to keep showing you this theme that was nonstop. I think it was like 3 1930, right? Oh no, this is when Hydron got cucked again. This is still funny though. Like Hydron's having a bad series, pops visor, boop, in the in the water you go. Like just can't catch a break. They're focusing in with these random freaking flanks. He's getting booped when he tries to be effective. Just not a fun map for Hydron. It worked it to their advantage, I'd say. But damn. And like, again, look where this guy is, is just located, where he's positioning himself. Who does this? Look at him just, he, he gets punished for it here, I believe. But like, geez, man, <laughs> can you like maybe tone it down a little bit? Why is that the objective the entire map? Eventually Toronto adjusts to it. I mean, that's kind of why they end up winning the map. They realize this goofy strategy they're doing and they ended up winning because of it. <laughs> it gave them some new life, maybe. It pissed off Hydron enough to go sicko mode the rest of the series. Particularly speaking, Dorado. I mean, Push really wasn't that close for a while. Defiant kind of had it in the bag. But it was Dorado where things got interesting because it seemed like Titans might actually extinguish the fire, like I was saying earlier, with how they started on their attack. But then Hydron takes over this game in perhaps one of the most dominant Widow showings I have ever seen watching this game professionally. And mind you to any of the newer viewers that came in like this season or maybe last season, I've been watching since 2018. And back then Widowmaker was far more relevant than what we see now. I got to witness people like Sia Player and Pine carry on the regular, but this is right up there with them. One of the most legendary Widow performances I've ever seen. Just willing your team to a victory, refusing to lose. The reason they're here at point C right now is because of Hydron, constantly getting picks. Like the Titans are trying to push up, make some space, boom, he sang's dead. And then Hydron ends up finding another one and another one, like boom, Crimson gone. It just kept on happening over and over throughout this attack. Just a blistering fast attack for Defiant, and it's all because Hydron hit every single shot. He was locked in. Look, Sugar Free dead. Lands a headshot on the Tracer. What on earth are you supposed to do about that if he's hitting every single shot? Like, surely they're trying to contest him, but it's not exactly easy, especially in a 5v5 setting. When you're hitting all your shots as Widow when you're hot, like, there's nothing you can do. Bam. He sang dead again. It, it was just over and over and over again. I, I can't even fathom how he was able to hit so many big shots in just one singular map. And I believe the stat total for him, when it was all said and done, on this map, on Widowmaker, just Widow, mind you, 
was 23 final blows, 19 of which were scoped critical kills, meaning headshot kills. 19 of his kills. And like, again, right off the start of the map, again, goodbye, Crimson. I think maybe even gets another kill early, right? It's just relentless. Hitting every shot. Oh, he kills Hisang here as well. Just threading the needle. Boom. Dead. He hit everything, man. It, it was a, a highlight reel in one map. You could literally make a montage off of this one map alone. And then even on the attack, I think he opens it up again. He, I think eventually he finds Sugar Free here. Or maybe not Sugar Free, but like he just, he makes space just with his presence alone. I don't know how he does it, man. And then in the end, Defiant gets to celebrate. Hydra knows that he's him. Everyone's like, bro, you're a god absolutely turned up to like super saiyan three levels of rage this is the definition of rage swapping onto widow you know when you can literally just hit every shot and you're unstoppable and it's funny too because he's saying actually for a while at least did a decent job of counteracting him in this map he's saying had a quite a few picks of his own during this map on dorado I'd say on Titan's attack and for a bit on their defense, he's saying was going blow for blow. He hit some pretty big time shots to allow Titans to finish this map, despite not really being like a hit scan specialist. You feel me? He found quite a few picks onto Hydron in the counter widow duel. He's finding ultraviolet. He, he did a lot. It's impressive, and I'm glad that he's doing well. I was in a losing effort this time, but I'm glad that he found his home on Vancouver. I've said it a lot, but it remains true. It's so cool to see him playing at the level that we all knew he was capable of before the season began. But as the series went on, Hydron took over and went rage mode. Rage swapped on to Widow, like actually cheating. Like, I think there's like that Defran clip from a while ago where like a Widow player turned up his hacks to like maximum. That's what it felt like, but just being good at the game. <laughs> Hydron went just too crazy. That, that's something that is once in a lifetime. That was the best game he's ever had. It's something we'll never forget. One of the best moments in Defiant history as well. Good on Hydron for willing his team to this win, being the leader, being that guy when his team needed him the most, especially when he struggled for most of the series. That's some great resilience. That's some great leadership. And that's a big clutch factor that you are looking for as a Defiant fan. Just a great game. I'm sorry, Vancouver fans, that it had to end this way, but it was a banger. And you never know. Y'all might end up meeting again before you know it. It's just so great to see the Battle of Canada be so competitive this year. All of their matches have been fun. Hydron's the man, though. What can you do? You did everything right for a while in this series, but you just couldn't close it out. And again, that's what worries me about Titans. They have a hard time closing anytime there's any real expectations, which sucks. But hey, you still got a chance in the loser's bracket. Meanwhile, Defiant are going to be playing the Boston Uprising in the upper bracket this weekend. That should be pretty exciting. We can talk about that a bit later. For now, though, we can move away from this specific game and move into the East super quick before I get back into West Plains, because East definitely had a pretty big headline as well. And it starts with the Soul Dynasty and Soul Infernal. These guys were the talk of the town in the Eastern Conference. I think I'm going to start with the Infernal, though. Because that's where things were very interesting, I'd say. So for, first and foremost, in this insane bracket that we ended up getting, and you know, I thought it would end with 0-2, but no, there was more. First and foremost, Infernal almost got forced into the play-in bracket because they could not defeat their big brother, so to speak, in the Soul Dynasty. All they needed to do was win this game and they clinched and they couldn't do that much. They end up getting third place in this tournament. And because of that, that opened up a window for O2 Blast or Dallas Fuel to potentially get in. As we know, neither of them were able to capitalize. Inferno were lucky enough to make it in anyway. But damn, that is not a good look to lose to the Dynasty like that when they've just been the better team all season. That's tough. Like, it's crazy to me how despite being the best team in the East, I'd say for most of this year up until recently, that they somehow damn near got sent down to the play-ins because they lost to their sole counterparts in one game. Not gonna lie, guys, this game was kind of depressing to watch. I think I have some gameplay I can play here. Um, I was not very happy with what I saw from Infernal. It was just weird. 
there was a lot of things going on with them. I will defend them in that regard, but I just didn't like what I saw with their composition choice. Um, Dynasty basically just took a large dump on their chest. They had no shot after the first map, but th it was just this this decision though that I think kind of made them a bit too one and well not even one dimensional just too confused with what they were doing and switching things up when it wasn't needed to and it gave the dynasty an opening to just play their own game stay consistent and they had it i don't get why they needed to play so much ryan in this series and so much wrecking ball as well and like they played diva too they played so many different heroes which just doesn't make a lot of sense i don't know where the queen was and where the orissa was from them heroes that they can show pretty good results on i don't know where that was i don't know why they weren't comfortable and they decided to pull a london and play so much ride in this series especially in situations where it may not be the most advantageous like on control that, that sure right it worked even they won the first map control is a perfectly acceptable place to play ryan always even push sometimes like it has its moments but here on eichenwald amongst some other places it was just strange not to mention the Wrecking Ball later on in the series and New Junk City, I believe it was. They were playing Wrecking Ball, which is very bizarre. It's a very bizarre choice. I mean, Mag did well, but it's hard to be stable, especially with this kind of setup with the Bastion as well. It, this comp, it's hard to play together, I feel like. They're all very split. So that, that was a questionable choice as well. I think they played Ball and D.Va on Dorado as well. And this map wasn't even close, by the way. Dynasty steamrolled them on Dorado. A bunch of this series was kind of close, but Iken and Dorado, th those clearly went the way of Soul Dynasty, I'd say. I just don't get where the Orisa and the Junker Queen is when you know you can play well on those. And those are probably the things you could have beaten Dynasty on in a mirror match, I feel like. You've shown that you're a good Bastion team, amongst other things. I don't see the need to change things up. Like, again, they're switching to Bastion here. They're playing Kiri, Brig. I just, there's no logic behind it. Unless there's something I'm missing. They, they tried too hard when all they had to do was play their own game to clinch. They didn't even have to be that clutch. They just needed to win this one. Screw the tournament. Just win this game, you don't have to try anymore. It can prepare for playoffs. But you nearly put your playoff lives in jeopardy because you decided to get, I don't want to say fancy, but you, you panicked, something went wrong. I don't know exactly what to pin it on. I think there's a lot of circumstances that led to it. But this was a pretty unacceptable way for them to go out. I know it was a five mapper, but they just look sluggish at times in this series. They didn't look that comfortable. I'd say that part of it is probably the fact that, as you can see on the screen, different main support playing Hyun Jae. I think having that change out of nowhere definitely sucks. It, literally, this was a one week thing. It happened this week where they had to make that shift out of nowhere. It's not easy to incorporate a new player like that out of the blue. I admit that. And on the topic of that, I guess I should explain it because I'm sure not everybody knows, but the reason Hyung Jae is here is because Fixa got injured. For the second season in a row now, the Soul Infernal slash Philly Fusion have gotten a player injury mere weeks before the playoffs. For those of you that were around last year who watched the East, Zest got hurt, he had a hand injury, and now it's Fixa who ends up having a hand injury. He made a bit of a post talking about it, apologizing, saying that I guess he slipped down the stairs, which is very unlucky, and he broke he broke his left little finger and bruised it, and supposedly he couldn't even make a fist without surgery, which is so sad. I feel really bad for the guy, but it's because of that that he ended up being out of commission, and now it's apparently unclear if he'll ever play again for the rest of the season. And that means Inferno, literally right as playoffs have to start, have to adjust to a new player in their lineup. They've been running the same five all year, and now they need a brand spanking new main support into the mix that they've got to get used to with his calls and with synergy. That's not easy. Fixa has been an integral part of their team this year. He's been a very consistent player. It's horrible news for Inferno fans, but also for Fixa. I think he has looked much improved this season compared to his rookie year. 
It's been a night and day difference, way more effective, way more consistent. And it's just tough to make a change like that so late into the year. I feel super bad for the Infernal. Perhaps all of this kind of ended up creating a shock factor in their system that they just couldn't recover from this early on. I think that would make the most sense, but it still doesn't necessarily explain some of their composition choices. You'd think with a new player, it'd be better to just stick to one or two things maybe, but they were all over the place, which isn't the best. Luckily though, like I was saying, it doesn't end up mattering in the end as Dallas couldn't clutch up against Spark. They got rolled 4 0 in fact, and O2 end up getting dismantled by the Dynasty in their rematch. O2 actually had a great opportunity to make the playoffs. The path was so clear with Infernal choking and Dallas just being worse than Spark. It actually amazes me that they couldn't beat the Dynasty of all teams, a team that just hasn't been impressive this year for the most part. More on that later on though. For now, I wanted to just bring up this whole East format slash Infernal thing super quick. There's been a lot of talk about how this format sucks and how Infernal almost got cucked out of something that never should have happened to begin with. And I have to agree, this Eastern format freaking blows. How does a team that has been dominant for G, I don't know, like 85% of their matches almost not make the playoffs automatically? They have won nearly every single game they have played over this year. Like how many games have they lost? They lost one to Dynasty. They lost a couple to Dynasty, one tournament, one regular season. They lost to what? The Sp Spark or no, who was it? Not even the Spark. They lost to Dallas. Like that's pretty much it. They lost only a couple of games. You can literally count it on one hand. That's how many games they lost in this particular region. And yet somehow they don't make the playoffs automatically because that makes sense. Apparently, like I get it. You wanted to stick with this idea of giving contenders teams a chance to shine, which is great. I'm glad they expanded the East. So it's not just six teams, but couldn't you have the best ones just complete or complete compete in the play-ins as well? I don't really see the issue with that. Like I get that it's a franchising thing and it would piss off the owners. That's understandable. Contenders teams getting a free ride while these owners had to pay off stuff as cheese. But like, come on, man, the charge and even the dragons don't even deserve to be there anyway with how they've played this year. You could argue the dynasty don't even deserve to be there. They're lucky they ended up making a tournament run to make up for it. Like, I don't think anybody would be complaining outside of the owners if you snuck in like O2 or Dreamers. It's just BS for a team like Soul Infernal to nearly have to go through the play-ins and potentially miss the playoffs altogether when they've just obviously been the best team there and now they're getting super unlucky. Like, should they have choked to Dynasty or even O2? No, definitely not. They should be the better team. But it doesn't matter. It's the principles. It's the principles, man. And it's all out of whack. And because of this format, it hasn't just led to anger, but also some confusion. Most people that I've talked to that don't super follow the league generally don't understand it. Do you know how many times people on my co-streams have been asking me questions about how the playoffs work? Nobody understands it. People were asking me constantly, are Dynasty in playoffs now because they won the tournament? Are Infernal out because they lost? Are Dallas out because they lost? Nobody bothered to properly explain this stuff outside of some random social media post. They needed to make a dedicated video or explain it on stream more, like to the Western audience as well. That lack of transparency is so concerning, and it just goes to show you they really don't give a damn about the East. Just know, if you weren't aware, if you don't know how it works, Infernal and Spark are in because their average placements between the spring and summer knockouts were the best of any other team in competition. Now, had O2 Blast beaten Dynasty, they would have had an average placement that was better than Infernal, but they lost, nothing you can do about it, so that's how it works. It's ridiculous, like I can understand it in some ways, but with all the confusion and the people getting upset about it, it just doesn't seem worth it to me. It's so silly, but that's how it goes, I guess. Okay, enough about that. How about we talk about the Dynasty? I've been avoiding them for long enough. We talked about the Infernal and the format, but Dynasty deserves some credit for how they played over the weekend.
First and foremost, again, they beat Infernal. They beat their little brothers. I guess they're big brothers this year with how they've constantly been worse. But they beat them down pretty good. Uh, very convincing map wins anytime they took them. And I'm thoroughly impressed with how they were able to make do with what they were given in this series. I think Infernal gave them a lot of leeway to do what they wanted to, as Infernal looked super uncomfortable swapping comps. Dynasty could just play around it, like playing on the high ground, as I mentioned before, on Eichenwald, as I showed you previously, and playing even on Dorado, doing the same thing. Just playing around what Infernal gives you, whether it be the Rhine or the ball, the stuff that you just know isn't as good compared to the comp you're running, they made it work. You got to give them some credit for that. They clutched up big time. They had absolutely no expectations coming into this weekend, and they ended up showing us the biggest sign of life we've seen all year from them. They marched in with everybody doubting them, and they beat both Infernal and O2 Blast back to back to win their second tournament ever. Now, be it it's a small tournament, but still, it counts. That's another first place on the resume, I guess. Now, considering how bad they played against O2 the last time, and how they could barely even eat, uh, defeat Sin Prisa like the other weekend, I'd say the bar was set pretty low for them. But this weekend, they were just a different team. You can say what you want about Infernal, but they still beat them. They took advantage, they clutched up in a map 5, and against a team that previously dominated them, they beat O2 Blast rather convincingly, as seen by the scoreline, a 4-1. It was so clean. They felt dominant in this one. They felt so much more confident than the last time. It's like they figured something out. Something clicked after being able to study their wrongdoings in the film, and maybe O2 as a young team felt the pressure a little bit, but in the end, Dynasty were just better. I think that old man Prophet still has something left to give after all. He played great. But more importantly, they got a very massive weekend out of Krillin and Bellos Rhea. Two unsuspecting, su un unsuspected superstars, I should say. Two people that you probably wouldn't trust to win you a game, but here they are doing it anyway. I mean, my guy Bellos Rhea in this series was the talk of the town. I don't know if he won player of the match or not. I think he did. Yeah, I can put up some Bellas Rhea highlights. My guy Bellas Rhea was the talk of the town in this series, though. He put on an Orissa clinic, which sounds cringy because it's Orissa, but I mean, he was super clutch. He did some crazy things with the environmental kills. He was really feeling it throughout the entire series. He looked good against Infernal as well, but this was like the coming out game for him, I'd say. This was the best game he's played all year, arguably, or the best in a long time. He was seriously feeling it, and I mean, if there's ever a time to show up, it's definitely in a now or never situation like this. You need to build up some confidence going into play-ins, and that's exactly what he did with this kind of performance. It's better late than never to improve and have a performance to show your team that you're reliable and that you're not some kind of weak point. It's such a huge confidence booster to play this well literally right before your playoff lives are on the line. People are calling this the Bellas Rhea game, and I agree. This could be the thing that actually awakens his peak form. For their sake, I really hope that it keeps up because he had a really awesome series, but he's not the only one. Krillin also played extremely well this weekend. In this game, but also in general, I think Krillin was excellent. I think there might be some Krillin highlights around here somewhere. It's alright, we'll just leave that up for now. There's Krillin. There you go. But um, with the back-to-back -back performances that he had in Alari settings, I'd argue that he is currently the best Alari over in the Eastern region right now. To be fair, not a lot of competition, but he's been like one of the only Eastern players that's been effective with her. He's found some really big value with her ults. I mean, that there is not the best example, but you know what I mean if you watched. He had a lot of big time pop offs, so he set up a lot of plays for his teammates to finish off those kills with the Captive Sun explosion and whatnot. It was really clean from him. He had a lot of big picks by himself, but then the ults were also so freaking massive. It's impressive that he found such value with that ult when there's so many counters to it right now. It can be hard to be that good with her and to really maximize her kit when you're playing against a Genji and Orisa and whatnot. And luckily, they didn't have to play a lot of Orisa or against a lot of Orisa this time around, but there's a Suzu as well that can screw you over. There's a lot of stuff that can counter her. 
but he made it work. I mean, I absolutely love what I saw from Krillin. I thought he was the unsung hero of the weekend and probably played some of the best games we've ever seen from him. He added an extra layer of playmaking to a dynasty team that has been desperately craving it. And in the end, it made it so they had one too many weapons to handle compared to some of these other teams. I mean, to witness the dynasty clutch up how they did was very unexpected. They felt dead in the water recently. They got boomed by former teammates. All hope seemed lost. But right when it mattered the most, they hit their groove. Overcoming some of those demons is like a very important first step if they want to get to the playoffs. And it is my hope that the Dynasty now ride this into the play-ins and find a way to come out on top. Every week is different, and I think they're far from consistent still, but I'm convinced there's a chance after playing like this. Getting hot at the right time is so crucial, and they're doing it. Really, all they have to do is beat Shanghai and Dallas. Those guys are threats for sure. They've had trouble with both of them this year, but it's very doable. Shanghai and Dallas have particularly not looked that great recently. Your Alaricom could get them some problems. The Arissa could be an issue as well. There's a serious opening for them to somehow make the playoffs when they've been terrible this year for the most part. I just hope that they use this momentum and their confidence boost to their advantage instead of just fizzling out and like losing to Shanghai again or something. They've got to do something with this. I'd be really sad if they don't. I overrated them drastically this season, but this is a way to make up for it a little bit. That'd be really cool to see them play well when it matters and kind of justify at least a little bit for my somewhat high placing in the power rankings. It probably won't happen knowing my luck, but I can be hopeful, right? <laughs> maybe just maybe they're going to let Profit have one last ride though. Oh, and I guess on the topic of the soul win, this was a tough loss for O2, huh? They literally did the hard part already. They beat both soul teams. I mean, they'd beaten Dynasty a couple of times at that point already and have always been competitive against Infernal this year. And Infernal and Dallas even did them the favor of choking. They had all the marbles, so to speak. All they needed to do was win this game against a team that they were very confident against beforehand. I don't really know what the change was. I guess Dynasty just figured them out. But all the hard stuff, in theory, was kind of already done for them. Everybody choked. Everyone stood in their own way and tripped over themselves. So the door was open for them to make the playoffs, to be the first contenders team, and probably the last, to make the Overwatch League postseason. It would have been a wild storyline, especially with guys like Who Are You and Lee Soo Min and Prophet not being wanted by the respective Owl teams and then making it there anyway to the playoffs. It just seems that they were one-dimensional in their composition choice, and finally it caught up to them with some film review from the Dynasty, I guess. In the end, despite tormenting them all year, or well, at least the last month or two, the Dynasty have gotten the last laugh over their former teammates and their rivals. It's just a shame, though, because O2 in the playoffs would have been super fun. I think it's kind of weird. It makes me a little uncomfortable. This idea of a contenders team being in playoffs, it's a little embarrassing, but it would have been cool because at least they're a fun team to watch. They have a lot of likable players. It's a super likable team. It would be hilarious and I think very fitting for the kind of season that we've had this year. But oh well. I think despite the shortcomings, O2 can have a pat on the back because they are without a doubt one of the most respectable franchises in the history of this esport, let alone the Overwatch League. They've won so many tournaments, and they've been so competitive for all these years, even being a challenge for OWL teams over the years. It just goes to show you they have a great system over there, a great farm system, a great training system. They're good at improving their players fast. It's a system that is set up for young players to show their talents and find success. Ownership and coaching over there is top tier, man. Some of the best you'll ever see. They've boasted some fantastic teams over the years, and so many of their alumni still dominate the league to this day. O2 Blast really is a goaded franchise. The fact that they got top three or better in two Overwatch League tournaments with two completely different rosters is impressive. I think they should feel proud. They're a model of consistency for franchises, and they're one of the best to ever do it, despite just being a contenders team for sure. Anyway, enough about that. I think you get the idea. That's the, the big highlights of the East this weekend. So let's talk a bit more about these Western play-ins, shall we? 
So, first we have the Boston Uprising, who managed to take care of business and get to the upper bracket finals, unsurprisingly, by defeating the one and only London Spitfire. Once again, they are showing us why they just shouldn't be here to begin with. They should not be in the plans. Their roster is clearly better than all of these others, at least in theory, unless like Defiant prove us wrong. They should just be the best of all of these guys for sure with all their former champions and veterans, and they proved it in this series against London Spitfire. It wasn't easy. London were very scrappy, super chippy for sure, but over time, it felt like Boston were in control, even though London did make a bit of a resurgence towards the end of the series. All their guys were clicking, though. Bird rings, Bastion, and one player of the match. Put a lot of pressure on Hottie, the way the Shock simply could not one day prior. Decay's Genji went very hard. I owe him an apology. His Genji is looking really good this year. I've doubted him for too long. And on top of that, I think that Smurf and Lee J gone also had really good days. Smurf is still insane on Arisa, by the way. Can we just talk about that? After all these years, even though our kid has totally changed, he is still one of the most impactful Arisas out there. It's weird, too, because Boston haven't really been playing her recently. They've much preferred the Junker Queen. But out of nowhere, they decided to rock the Arisa. I'd assume to counter Ryan, which is a great counter to Ryan, and it worked beautifully. I thought that he set up a lot of good plays for his teammates in this one. I'll talk about it a bit later when I go over my performers of the week. Hint, hint, Smurf is my tank player of the week. But he did really good. He definitely outplayed Hottie. He made his life a nightmare. There were more than a few moments where he was cucking him from shatters and making Admiral Ajax and whatnot. He just had a big, impactful performance. And maybe it goes a little unnoticed just because of some of the crazy stuff that Lee Jae Gon was doing with his boops and the Bastion and Decay going crazy on the Genji. But it was a really impressive series from him and the rest of the guys. They really let loose. Early on, I was a bit worried. London took that first map, they won Oasis, and I was like, oh damn, here we go again. Somehow Boston are going to play down to their competition, but they managed to hold strong. Even going to Midtown, which was uh, London's map selection against Shock, actually, they seemed pretty comfortable on that map, but Boston still managed to put them in their place, even severely staggering Hottie late into this map, and kind of just making them throw and be confused by Lee J. Gaunt's antics and whatnot. It was a great response, because Oasis, I was not impressed. There was a couple of moments that were great, but their support line really struggled in this first map, but they bounced back strong, and that's what you want to see if you're a Boston fan. Don't consistently play down to a team that you're better than. And that's why things kind of went their way for the rest of the series. Esperanza was actually kind of sweaty at the end. It seemed like London actually had a chance to win this map. But sadly, even though they're in a 3v5 for a little bit, as Lee Jae Gon was taxiing Izayaki in the final fight because he got picked prior, London still could not stop Boston from finishing that map. It's crazy to me. It happened in like the same fashion as the first time. In week one, literally week one, this same exact scenario popped up where London looks super competitive against Boston and they have a chance. They have an advantage even on Esperanza and then they let Lee J gone ruin their lives. He did it again, this time on Lucio, coming back last second, being the hero. I don't know how they keep getting away with it and I don't know how London keep on losing in these scenarios. It's wild stuff, but I'm glad that Boston took care of business. Business. I think it was in the words of Pre, their general manager, saying that they deserve some credit for beating London just because they're a hard team to prepare for. And that's definitely true, right? London have a very weird style that you're not going to get any practice against in scrims. Nobody else is doing what they do. They're a very unique team. So coming in with the right game plan without the practice is super tough. But Boston made it work because they're a super intelligent team. They're awesome. They got better coaching now. Their players are great. They just did everything correctly, even though it was a little close for comfort. And it makes me wonder how the Defiant series is going to go. They did what they had to. And I think that they're looking good because they're probably a lot more prepared for Toronto than they'd be for Boston. So, or Boston, than they'd be for London, excuse me. So I'd say that Boston are in pretty good shape right now. I'm liking where they're at for sure. As for the London Spitfire, they put up a pretty good fight overall. Again, I think some of these middle maps didn't go their way, not the best showing, 
but I think the first and the fourth map, they showed some great signs of life, and that could give some of these other teams trouble in the rest of the bracket. Literally, I think they're capable of beating anybody else not named Boston. They made it super competitive, and they rolled the shock at the same time. I really do think they have an opportunity because of their synergy, because of their weirdness. They have a lot of the right stuff. They're just a hard team to play against since their play style is so rare to find these days. I love their teamwork. I love their confidence. The issue though, the thing that makes me worry about them is that they always seem to choke at the worst moments. Like I was saying, they very easily could have taken Boston to a map five in that scenario where they had the numbers, but they failed. And who could even forget about control against the shock? Reasonably, they probably should have 3 0 the San Francisco shock, but they choked a 99-0 lead on the second round of Busan and then proceeded to get 100-0 on the third. Like, they have to learn to stop throwing away these advantages. Yes, they've been playing some good teams, they've been playing some superstar players, but you can only credit the other teams so much when it seems to happen anytime they have a chance to prove themselves. And in a do or die scenario like this, where it is win or go home, you can't make these mistakes. You're out of chances. Another screw up like this and your season is over a lot earlier than you'd like it to be, mind you. The only good news, like I was saying, is I think that the loser's finals is very doable. It won't be easy, mind you, but I'd argue that they are in a better space than shock and justice bare minimum. And I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they beat the Vancouver Titans. They're not that special either from what we've seen. It's just a matter if they could beat Boston and or Toronto. Them playing Toronto's poke style, I think could be interesting. I'd say there's a better chance than they'd get against Boston, just because Toronto might crumble if London's super aggressive. They could actually snuff out Majed and those other guys super quick if they play right. So despite the choking concerns, I think a playoff spot is very doable for them, especially because again, Toronto did look human in the Vancouver game. Nobody's invincible and every day is different. So London fans don't get too discouraged just yet. Just know that it's not going to be easy. Your target really has to be either Boston or Toronto. I'd say preferably Toronto. It's not going to be easy regardless of who it is. They're both Arisa teams and that kind of screws over your Ryan comp, but Defiant have shown more weaknesses. And if they lose to Boston badly, maybe they'll get boomed. But we'll see. I think that these other teams all are probably ones they'll beat, or they should at least. Like Shock, they looked very poor in this series after the first map. Justice, just like the Shock, basically just have one strategy. Rely on your flex TPS to kill everything, and if he doesn't, they lose. And Titans, while they did show some resilience and maybe don't have as much pressure on them after losing that game and getting the bad one out of their system, it's still tough to come back from something like that. Getting reverse swept, not to mention having Hydron live in your head rent-free now. You talk smack to him, you focused him, and he absolutely dominates you on map 5. That's the kind of stuff that can literally derail a season. When a player dominates you like that and completely ruins everything, when one man can do that to you, that's tough to come back from. So reasonably speaking, I'd argue London have the best mindset of all these other losers brackets teams right now. So, you know, I wouldn't rule it out. I wouldn't rule out the possibility of them making playoffs still. They might have the third best odds right now. Speaking of the shock, by the way, their lives are on the line too, which you'd argue is more interesting just because of the stature of their franchise and their expectations this year. If they lose one more time, they are out of the playoffs and will not be there for the first time since the inaugural season. Since the inaugural season, they've won twice, they've gotten second once, and they've gotten what, like top four, top three, I think it was top four once as well. The worst they've done since the inaugural season is like top four in the playoffs. And back then, they had Nomi, Nevix, and Dak as half of their starters for a while. A shock team with very high expectations coming into this year, at least from the fan perspective, might go out accomplishing literally nothing. They haven't done anything this year. It is really, really sad. But the truth is, they don't look coordinated. 
It's basically proper go kill or lose miserably trying. Things went very wrong. They ended up not being able to have their initial core gel together. So they made these changes last second. And it's because of that that it's just hard for the new guys to gel with the rest of the team. Having Probe be incorporated and Renko and Luke Mino and giving Max more playtime, that can be confusing at this point in the season. It's hard. They just can't get it right. They can't get that consistency outside of proper. They just over rely on him. And when he can't do it alone, when he can't just go crazy on like a Genji or a Tracer or a Sojourn, it's tough to win. It's just really, really hard. Things started off very promising in the London, in the London series. Like I really thought they might actually be able to beat them, like I said in my prediction video last weekend. But then the coordination and just that teamwork diff got them absolutely manhandled throughout the rest of the set. After map one, Shock were not in control at all. They even C9 had they a couple of the worst C9s we've seen in a while in the same map on Midtown. We're gonna try and locate them here real quick. I forgot previously, but they had like a decent attack going as well. It seemed like they might be able to force out backbones ult here and they'll be good but the problem is nobody is near the cart they're all pushing up forward they're all trying to be aggressive and get this advantage but proper needs to rush to the cart when it shouldn't even be his job to begin with like look at this backbone guys c9 sparker c9 hottie c9 so this cost them potentially finishing the map and being in a bad place to defend and then later on in the same map it happens again and this one's also pathetic i get it you want to go for like a crafty strategy here, a crafty TP, maybe throw them off guard. But because you literally have everyone and your mother follow them, London are like, we don't have to fight you guys. Like this window is pointless. We'll just walk it in. We'll just walk the dog. What are you going to do? <laughs> it's so insane how they have two bad C9s in the same map. And you can tell this is something that just completely and utterly boomed them. Because of how this map started and how good it looked, they never recovered mentally. And that's when London realized, ah, we're going to beat these guys. That There's absolutely no reason. The number of times that Probe was getting picked first actually needs to be studied. It was insane how he was dying consistently on the Symmetra. The TPs were constantly off the mark, be going in by himself instead of like doing the typical bait teleporter. He TP in, nobody's there with him, TP's dead and he dies. It happened way, way too many times. There's just no reason your Symmetra should be dying that much. I don't understand. Sometimes it was them getting outplayed, but then there are other moments like um, the TPs, like I was saying. Was the probe TP here? I don't remember. Or no, this time proper gets picked. We get the idea. Just, it's amazing how their DPS consistently would get picked. I don't know how. I don't know how they're able to be so good and so bad at the same time. It frustrates me when they show potential like they did on Control, just for stuff like this to start happening, where that lack of coordination really makes them pay. The number of times that Probe and Proper were getting picked this map was crazy. Their teamwork was just too shaky, and in general, it's too shaky this late into the season. It can't be like this if you want to be a playoff team. Even being like a mid-playoff team, those guys have it down a little bit more than this. It's just not good. Like, what we saw against the Spitfire is enough to suggest their season is literally over. They can't connect consistently, and the Lucio struggles are just no bueno. Renko can't keep up with veterans. He can't do it. His lack of experience on Lucio makes him pay over and over again. It's not his fault. He's literally a flex support player, but that's just how it goes. You can't expect him to keep up with Admiral and like with Chio the other day. It's not going to happen as much as we want it to. There's a Lucio issue amongst some other things going on. Not to mention that the Shock were super set in their ways with the Queen when they probably should be trying Orisa against the Reinhardt comp like Boston did. They just need a complete strategy overhaul at this point. What they're playing requires too much coordination, and it's coordination they don't have. They need to dumb it down if they want to have a chance. I know that's crazy, and it's probably not going to work either, but it's better than doing the same exact thing and bashing your head into a wall. Look at how badly London are dominating them, going up into their spawn. How can you expect to make a playoff runner even get there if you can't even beat London? Like, London aren't a bad team, but... You've got to do better than that, man. You just have to. I don't know what they're going to do. 
They have to do something else if they want to win. They just don't look comfortable. They looked very uncomfortable against London, and odds are that's going to continue unless the Justice do them a favor and knock out London, but Justice are basically the same team as the Shock, so we sure as hell know that ain't happening. I just don't know what they're going to do. You've got to study up on that Boston game in fast, because even if you beat Vancouver, you're going to be playing London again. <laughs> There's just no ifs, and or, ands, or buts here. Unless Vancouver are absolutely cracked, you're probably playing these guys for, a, what is it, a third time now? It doesn't look good, guys. Shock fans, I'm sorry, but I need to see a very different Shock team next, next week and beyond even if they want to have any kind of results. Otherwise, we're going to see one of the most disappointing years literally ever. Time's running out, guys. Tick, 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 tick. Check your clocks. Anyway, you get the idea. Shocker in the danger zone officially. I was hoping to see some life, you know, proper cheesing his way to getting back to the playoffs, angry proper, but without any real team coordination behind him, it ain't gonna happen. Let's talk now about the Washington Justice, our final Western game that we did not cover, I believe. Well, aside from Justice versus Defiant, but not much to talk about there. But Justice go on to defeat the New York Excelsior in a single elimination matchup. They take them down in 3-1 fashion, and Justice were just the better team in this one, unfortunately. It sucks that New York don't get another chance. It, it's awful because they literally had more wins than this Justice team, but they don't really deserve it with how they played, I feel like. They completely abandoned their identity. They willingly chose to avoid running Lucio, which just feels like a mistake. You can still play Orisa if you want to, but what's this need to play the Alari Bap when that's not really OG's comfort and maybe not even Creative's comfort either? Just put OG on Lucio and Creative on Bap. It's what's worked for you recently. You've won some quality games using this composition setup. Run what your supports like to play. There's no need to change up your strat when literally your season's on the line like this. That's like my one gripe with New York in this game. I wasn't expecting them to win to begin with, but it's sad that they played in a way that just doesn't make sense. But then again, maybe they really didn't stand a chance regardless of what they decided to play. I think personally they could have made this series closer if they played a different style, but with how Alpha Yi was playing, maybe it would not have mattered as he carried so hard. He deadlifted literally on two different maps, once again showing us why he probably should have been in the MVP race. He's basically what proper is, but for the justice. You live and die by the Alpha He Genji, amongst other things, and the gamble paid off against NYXL. Not so much against Toronto, but I can't really expect it in that situation. That over-reliance just isn't good enough against the top teams. Like, it's fun to watch Alpha He go ham, but it is only going to get you so far. And now they play a team like London, so their season might be over here. And if it isn't, there's still a long uphill battle ahead of them. But still, they did enough to beat New York and at least make play-ins, which is cool. That was the big hope for Justice. The expectations were mixed with these guys, so at least they've gotten this far, right? Now they'll continue onward and we'll see what happens. In the meantime, while I'm not really super confident in the Justice, I wanted to acknowledge the New York Excelsior. I mega doubted them coming into this year. They were absolute crap in the preseason, and all the rumors in the world were indicating they were trash. But what we got instead was a pretty respectable season. This was the best year they've had in years. The last time they were in any kind of playoff contention was 2020, so I'm sure seeing a trend in the correct direction was a really good feeling for them and for their fans. A team that lost to Twisted Minds in the Pro-Am actually managed to win seven games this year. Granted, I'd say their resume isn't super impressive. A bunch of their wins were pretty free, but they had their bright spots. The Titans game, the Justice Sweep, the reverse sweep versus the Gladiators, the midseason knockouts W that they got against Toronto. And along the way, I think a lot of their players proved to the rest of the world, really, that they still have what it takes to be Overwatch League caliber players. Fitz had yet another excellent season on his resume. He gapped the opposition more than a couple of times. He carried this New York team a bunch. He deserves a ton of credit. And how about Creative? He had a sneaky good campaign. 
that saw him take another step forward in his game. I know that I used to call him overhyped a lot and overrated. I get it. I I was wrong. But these days, I think that he has elevated himself to something that we didn't even see back during the 2020 playoffs days or even last year. He's no longer just an Ana player anymore. That was always his claim to fame, Dynasty during kickoff clash, Dynasty in the 2020 playoffs, but now he's more well-rounded, and I think that's really come into form the last year and a half. It started, honestly, as early as the playoffs on Houston, but this year he's really developed it even further. I think his Baptiste has come a long way. If you remember 2021, his BAP was pretty mid, and I think his Kiri has genuinely been one of the best in the league this year. Creative did so much with a lot less than other top-level flex supports, and in my opinion, this was the best season of his career, at least individually. Some of you might disagree with me, but I think he's truly developed into a desirable flex support now. I respect him fully, not compared to me from a couple of years ago, even the beginning of last year, honestly. Then there's Kellen, though. This guy had absolutely zero chance with what he was working with last year. That team absolutely sucked. He was expanding his hero pool also, and he was making mistakes as a rookie, which is understandable. And because of that, he felt like a letdown just knowing what he was in contenders. But this year, he was an actual leader for this New York team. The progression in his hero pool was extraordinary. And with a better backline plus support coaching, or plus support coaching, plus better coaching, a better backline plus better coaching, I should say, it was a solid year from him. Honestly, I have nothing but good things to say about him. He looked great. And honestly, shout out to Shockwave and Psycho as well. I was pretty worried that neither of them would ever get another chance in the league, but they made the most of this opportunity. I think they both had some pretty solid years that they should feel proud of. New York came in with rather small expectations and they were able to surpass them. I don't know about majorly, but hey, they made play-ins. That sure as hell is a lot further than I thought they'd get. I apologize to all of the NYXL fans watching. I gave you guys a lot of crap this year and I did not believe in them one bit, but you were firmly a play-in team. Even if the Gladiators didn't choke, you'd still be better than the Justice record-wise. So congrats on the bounce back year. This is really awesome. It sucks that the league might be ending now, but at least you're ending it on a good note if this really is the end. That's pretty much my thought process on the play-ins as well as the East Knockouts. So now we're going to move into ATP's Performers of the Week, where I give you a player from Tank, DPS, and Support that really impressed me or really interested me for one reason or another, whether it was because they played well or because they were funny memes. This is why I picked a specific player, because I thought they were awesome and they had a really good week. So starting with Tank, I am going with Smurf, like I kind of spoiled before. I think his Arisa was great in this series. I don't have a lot of highlights to show. He didn't win player of the match in this one, but he played really good. He set up his teammates really well with this Arisa. There was this sick combo with Lee Jae gone. He ulted, and then Admiral, as you can see, he was trying to go for a beat, but then after kind of getting snagged into the air, you have Lee Jae gone boop him up even further. He dies before he can land, and it was plays like that that Smurf was kind of doing throughout the entire series. And along with that, he made Hottie's life a nightmare. He just played a really good Arisa. It was vintage Smurf like we saw during his shock days. It's like he never left, man. It's like he's always been the Arisa god that we saw from Overwatch 1, even with a different kit and her playing differently. He's still just a Chad. Smurf is the GOAT, and you can never underestimate that guy. As for DPS, I mean, no brainer here. It's Hydron. He literally won this game by playing like a maniac on map 5 entering the flow state, so to speak, going ultra instinct, whatever you want to call it, hitting shot after shot after shot to clinch this, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with He Sang and even playing better than him as the series went on. He did everything correctly. All he was doing was hitting the big shots, you know? I mean, how can you lose if your Widow hits everything? She can. This is when she's game-breaking, when she just hits every freaking headshot. Hydron was in the zone. He was the man. He is him. He made it absolutely impossible for Titans to win this series. They had a chance coming into this one, but he ruined it. And again, as you can see, the stat line, absolutely insane. This is just on Dorado. That's ridiculous to get 19 headshot kills like that. I don't know how he was able to do that after the rough series he had. Give it up to Hydron for being the GOAT and for being the hero of Toronto. And then finally, 
my last player of the week on support is Krillin. Never thought I'd hear myself say that, but here we are. Krillin was goaded this weekend to amazing games on the Lari. I think he's the best Lari in the Eastern Conference right now. He hit a lot of big time shots, a lot of big time ults, and he's giving the dynasty a new dimension that they've never really had up until this point this season. Flex support has been a struggle pretty much the entire year. First, Lee Su Min not being the most comfortable, not doing the best in like an Ana meta. He really needed a Kiriko to succeed, didn't have it. And then you also had the fact that your main support situation was weird. You had Krillin on main support, in fact, so he was uncomfortable. You make the swap, you let him play his natural position, you pick up this hero, you give yourself a unique identity that like no other Eastern team, or at least Eastern Owl team is running, and you've made it work. And even on the BAP, again, just really good stuff from him. Really smart series, super impactful with his playmaking, a very rare Krillin W. This is what you want to see. This is what he needs to show us right before the playoffs start. If he can channel this again, there's a chance they could beat Dallas. It's not going to be easy, even though Dallas got boomed by Spark. Dallas are just a really good team. But if he can play like this, I'm very confident he could outplay MCD. I mean, why wouldn't he? <laughs> He's obviously going to have more of an impact if he has a performance just like this one. The ults were just crazy, though. Super efficient with his ults. It's rare to see the Alari ult get that kind of value, I feel like, in Al, just based off of the first few weeks, at least. Really good stuff from Krillin. Super proud of him for having the best game I've maybe seen ever, or at least in a long time. So, cool stuff. Boom, kills MN3, why not? So, yeah. That's all I've got for you in terms of our performers of the week. Smurf, Hydron, and Krillin are my choices. I think pretty obvious ones. <laughs> they all kind of took over in one way or another. But now we're going to do a quick look ahead before we end today's podcast episode. So, one thing to note. This weekend, starting on September 15th, we have the play-ins for the Eastern Conference. Because there's only four teams, their tournament will last just the weekend. It'll start on Friday and go all the way until Sunday with the final, with said team going to Toronto alongside the Soul Infernal and the Hungzhou Spark. And you have every other Eastern Owl team that did not make it in automatically. Obviously, Dallas Fuel are the favorites here. There's just no question there. They've been the best team of this group for sure, at least on the air. But every week's different. You never know when somebody's going to get hot at the right time. That's why I say don't sleep on the Dynasty. You probably don't expect much from Charge, but like Dragons, if Dynasty meet Dragons in the lower bracket, maybe Dragons cuck them again. There's a lot of interesting stuff that can play out here, but generally it's going to be Fuel and Dynasty that everybody's looking at to potentially make that final spot. Should be a lot of fun to see if Dynasty can take advantage of what's been given to them, or if they're just going to choke again and continue to be a letdown, as they've done for most of their existence. As for the Western play-ins, they're also going to conclude, and we're going to find out the final two teams that will be joining in the playoffs in Toronto. The winner of Toronto versus Boston is going to go automatically in the winner's finals. They're set. And then we'll have the losers, where Shock, Titans, Justice, and London all have their playoff lives on the line. They'll get eliminated one by one, and then they'll meet the loser of Toronto-Boston in the loser's final. Winner of that game also goes on to the playoffs. I don't know what's going to happen. That Western lower bracket could be very interesting, especially if Toronto continue to slip up more. Could be anyone's game. And if Boston somehow lost, I'd love to see how they respond. It's going to be a fun weekend of Overwatch. The stakes have never been higher. More teams are going to get eliminated. It's going to be great. Make sure to tune in to all of those games. It all starts on Friday morning slash night for my Americans when the Eastern teams play. And then we will go from there. I'll be co-streaming the West games again. Let me know what you think is going to happen down in the comments below. I'll be making a prediction video later this week for sure. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the podcast though. It was a great time. I had a lot of fun. The games were super awesome. The results were super unexpected. I had a great time and I'm looking forward to some more great action this upcoming weekend. If you enjoyed the podcast, it would mean a lot to me if you could leave this video a like, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and make sure to check out the link if you want to check out some of the other podcast episodes I've done. We've already done 13 of them now, including this one, so there's lots to catch up on. I've been ATP, have yourselves a good one, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.